Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated wherever you are. Well, a few years ago now, Harold Kushner, a Jewish rabbi, not that I suppose there's any other kind of rabbi, wrote a book you may have heard of. Its title was Attention Grabbing, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Rabbi Kushner wrote this book after the death of his son Aaron at the age of 14. Aaron died of a rare and incurable genetic disorder called progeria. And progeria, it causes premature aging. Virtually no one with this order lives longer than their early teens. And Aaron's death, it forced Rabbi Kushner, well, to face some fundamental questions. First of all, what kind of God would create a world that has progeria in it? And what kind of God would, would let his son Aaron, who he loved, who was a good kid on the cusp of adulthood, die? of this terrible disease. These are powerful questions, aren't they? Maybe they are questions that we have also had in one way or another in our own lives. Personally, I'm tempted to ask my own version of these questions, not just when someone young and promising dies, but whenever anyone I love dies. There are certainly people who have lived more or less full lives when they die, and, and there are certainly better and worse ways to die. But death is still death, and I don't like death. I don't want death. I, I hate losing people as we lost our friend Elizabeth Hudgens this last week here at Epiphany. So why? Why suffering and death, God? One answer, in fact, the one that Rabbi Kushner settled on in his book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, is that God is good and God is loving, but, but God is not actually all-powerful. That is, he says, God is more like a good parent than a great king. There are limits to his authority over evil and chaos in the world. The upside of this answer is that it allows Rabbi Kushner to, to let God off the hook for his son Aaron's death. As he sees it, God weeps for his son's suffering and death with his family. But God couldn't stop Aaron's death any more than they could. That's the upside of this answer. It lets God off the hook. The downside and it's a major downside, is, is that a God who is more a well-meaning but, but limited parent than Lord of all, well, that's not God as described in Scripture. God in the Bible can rescue people from death and, and does that from time to time. And he can do it in spectacular ways, like, like, for instance, parting the Red Sea for Israel when they were trapped by Egypt's army. And God can do it quietly as well, like, like Jesus did for Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5. You know, we actually get another answer to this question about God's, God's responsibility for our suffering in our Old Testament reading today from Ezekiel 18. And you see, in this moment, the moment we see described in Ezekiel it's not an individual tragedy like, like Aaron's death that forces these questions. Instead, it's bigger than that. It's, it's actually the suffering of a whole nation. You see, when Ezekiel is written, the people of Judah in their tens of thousands are in exile. They have been forced to leave everything behind, everything they love behind, and resettle hundreds of miles from their homeland. 
Ezekiel himself is a priest now without a temple and a prophet. He's part of this, this group of Jews who now live in the country of Babylon on the bank of the Kibar Canal next to the Euphrates River just north of the city. And among these people, these people suffering in exile in Babylon, there's this proverb. We, we hear, hear it in verse 1 of chapter 18. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now what this proverb is getting at is, is that the children, the exiles, are suffering. Suffering in Babylon not for anything they personally have done, but because of what their fathers, what somebody else did. And it's true, biblical even, that that their fathers made bad choices and that they were warned that they could lose their homeland because of it. The very last chapter of 2 Chronicles, which, which provides the history for this, says this about the generation before the exile It says, all the officers of the priests and people likewise were exceedingly unfaithful. Following the abominations of the nations, they they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. So why are these tens of thousands of exiles suffering in Babylon? Well, they believed it was because of their fathers, because of what they had done. And this this explanation for suffering, it's attractive as well, but for the opposite reason that, that Rabbi Kushner's answer may seem attractive. You see, here in Ezekiel 18, God's lordship isn't being questioned by these exiles. Instead, what they're questioning is God's justice. I mean, it's not fair. It's not fair for sons to pay for the sins of their fathers, and they know it. We see this right here in our passage in Ezekiel. Look at verse 25 of chapter 18. Yet you say the way of the Lord is not just. The way of the Lord is not just. It's not fair. So things aren't looking looking great for God here, are they? As we try to understand why, why bad things happen to good people. Either, in spite of everything the Bible says to the contrary, God is really not as powerful as he's been made out to be. That is, he's just as flummoxed by evil and chaos as we are. That's Rabbi Kushner's answer. Or, God isn't actually just in the end. That is, God does things like punish his sons for their father's sins. That's the answer of the exiles by the Kabar Canal in Babylon. Which is it? Well, of course, the answer isn't actually either of those choices. It's a false choice. We don't really have to choose between God's lordship and God's justice. And Ezekiel 18 shows us this by managing to hold on to both as it answers the challenge of these exiles who who believe they're being unjustly punished for their father's sins. And the first thing Ezekiel 18 does in verse 4 is it, is it points to God's lordship over absolutely everyone. It says, behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, is mine. In other words, it's saying Rabbi Kushner's answer about limiting God doesn't work. There is no one, it says, whose life does not ultimately belong to God. He owns us all, so to speak. He may indeed grieve with us, and in fact, Jesus shows us that he does. But God is not powerless 
in the face of evil and chaos. God is not powerless in the face of evil and chaos. Does that mean then that that everything that has ever happened to us is in some way God's will? Is our sicknesses God's will? Our sufferings, even when the time comes, our death? Was the death of Aaron, Rabbi Kushner's son, God's will? Was it God's will that Elizabeth died early this week? It seems to me that that we must answer yes to this question. At least, at least in the sense that, that God clearly does not prevent bad things from happening to us and to people that we love. Friends, either God is the Lord of all creation or he isn't. And the witness of the Bible and the witness from Ezekiel chapter 18 in particular is that he is. Friends, I think it is better that we, that we risk raging against God because it seems he allows bad things to happen that we do not understand than it is to believe that evil and chaos are more powerful than he is. So God is Lord. He is king. He is much more than just a concerned parent. And he must be Lord, or friends, he is no God for us. But is he a just Lord? Do the exiles have a point when they call out God with their proverb, literally their proverb about sour grapes? How does God respond to them here in Ezekiel? Well, this is what he says. He says, hear now, O house of Israel, hear, exiles of Judah. Is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? God turns the question back on them. He, in effect, tells the exiles to to examine themselves and their own lives before hurling charges of injustice against him. God clearly says here in Ezekiel that that he rewards righteousness and and punishes sin, not not just in broad brushstrokes, but in individual lives. Here, verse 26, when a a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and, and does injustice, he shall die for it. And verse 27, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed, and does what is right and just, he shall save his life. In other words, friends, Ezekiel 18 is saying that God is just, absolutely so. He judges us based on our choices, whether or not we have chosen wickedness or goodness. Here, verse 30, therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. And by the way, that's a picture of God's judgment that that Jesus himself repeats, doesn't he? Remember the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. So where does this leave us? God is Lord, and God is just, yet bad things still happen to us. Why is that? Well, what Scripture calls us to to face up to again and again is the same thing that Ezekiel 18 calls the exiles to face. Not so much God's character, but our own. In In other words, what if God is right here in Ezekiel? What if he isn't the problem? What if just maybe... We are. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God as as how Romans 3 verse 23 puts it, how it expresses the same idea, an idea that you can find all the way back in Scripture in Genesis 
at the very beginning. Maybe, just maybe, we aren't the great people that we think we are. And you know, we have just amazing abilities to deceive ourselves about this, don't we? I was reminded of my ability to deceive myself this past week. My smartwatch thing I have on my wrist here got a new update. And one of the things it can do now is tell me how I'm washing my hands and whether or not I'm doing it for 20 seconds. Guess what I learned? I have never washed my hands for 20 seconds in my life until I got this smartwatch. It's helped me face a hard truth about myself. I was deluding myself. Friends, what if the real surprise, the, the real injustice, if you will, isn't that bad things happen to good people like us, but instead that, that good things happen to bad people like us? And friends, make no mistake, good things are what God wants for us. He wants good for sinners. I love how clearly verse 31 and verse 32 of, of Ezekiel 18 capture God's desire, saying, why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. Turn, repent, and live. Friends, the word of God to each of us this morning is, is straightforward. It is not to get distracted examining the morals and ethics of others. It is not even to get distracted trying to weigh God's morals and ethics, to pit God's justice and his lordship against each other in some way. It is to look look closely and as clearly and as delusion-free as we can at our own lives. It is to repent of our own sins. Is it not your ways that are not just, says the Lord? What we see here in Ezekiel is that that's what God wants from us. He wants to do us good, not evil. He is always ready to accept our repentance, no matter how late in the day it may seem. Friends, our problem is not God's weakness, and it certainly isn't God's injustice in some way. And really, our problem isn't exactly our own sins either. God, God deeply desires to forgive us our sins. And through Jesus Christ, he has offered every one of us the same full and free forgiveness. Our problem every time, well, friends, it's our own unwillingness to repent. I think this is especially true for church people, religious people like us. That certainly was the case in Jesus' day, and and my experience is, is that people are pretty much the same. I mean, did you, hear, did you hear what he said, what Jesus said this morning in our gospel reading from Matthew 21? He's talking about exactly this. He says, truly, I say to you, the tax collectors, people we might call extortioners today, the extortioners and, and the prostitutes, the whores, they go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness. And friends, what John preaches is simply repentance of sins. God, John came to you in the way of righteousness and and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they believed him. They repented, is what Jesus is saying. Well, Well, people that really should have known better were unwilling to do so. Friends, even though we do struggle, and struggle honestly, with the whys and wherefores, we know God is just, and we know God is Lord. And we also know that our ways are often not just. And we know, and we know we struggle to repent. So instead of examining God Let's examine our own lives as honestly as we can. 
And even more, let's turn back, turn away from our own sins. Amen.